Good evening, everyone. Uh, why don't we get underway with the Marin Energy Authority meeting for Thursday, August 2nd. Welcome. Hope everyone's enjoying the summer so far. Uh, item one, board announcements. Any announcements? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move to item two, public open time. Good evening, Barbara. Good evening. Um, we uh, had a number of people at the CPUC today and uh, a lot of support for Lauren's energy efficiency program. Um, we also asked for a hold on the item because we wanted to get 40% instead of 15%. And it was an issue that was kind of like, I didn't totally understand how it was working because the way this process works at the commission, it's in documents that are not labeled, and I've been so busy I did not know this was coming down the pike. And Barbara, if I can interrupt for one second, are you talking about uh, the, 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 agenda, the, uh, the agenda is the item though, right? Uh, no, I'm talking about the 2012. You're talking about 2012. Yeah, okay. which was going to be, you know, there was a resolution today which would have only given us 15%. I mean, it turned out to be all we'd asked for, and I didn't realize that. But, um, you know, I feel like the, the um, staff really, um, you know, basically told our folks that we could only get that much. But that was based on something called statewide and regional programs that we would not be allowed to get that money. But there is no such thing as a regional energy efficiency program right now. And, and there are, it's never appeared in the documents. And so the staff basically came up with a brand new definition of regional and said, oh, okay, you don't get all that 25% of the money. And I'm like, no, <laughs> we, should, we should be able to get our 40%. That's, I mean, I think we should be getting all of it, and that's another issue. But anyway, in this process, we had a, an alert going out, and a bunch of people who came, um, but we were working with the Sierra Club um, Energy Committee, and I just want to let people know that a very strange thing happened. It turned out that the Energy Committee listserv has had uh, President Peavy's advisor on it for years. We didn't know that. And so all of our alerts and um, all of our commentary on, on MEA and CCA in general have been going straight to the commissioner. Um, and the, you know, the feedback, I mean, we didn't realize it until yesterday, and I looked back at this guy's email, Scott Bergeshaw, and it turned out that he had, you know, he had said that several times, but it was so kind of not what anybody was expecting that we didn't register that he was on the list. And he was just making comments, but, you know, he would say, you know, I worked with President TV to do this. <laughs> you know, but like, one of the weird things was that in the last day, um, he must have sent 10 emails, um, you know, discussing this with us on the list. So we probably got more time from the commissioner's office than, I mean, than I had ever gotten from PD's office. Um, and it is interesting that he was that, you know, concerned about the Bay Chapter, you know, what we were doing and, and about the NEA's program. So um, obviously this, you know, the situation went straight to the Mr. TV. And somebody ended up holding it. We had asked for a hold so that we could, you know, go back to the staff and say, hey, we don't really think this is, you know, fair to, you know, take take out this money for regional programs that don't exist. Um, so anyway, we do have that time between now and the 23rd, and I hope that um, I hope that's, you know, the, the agency will support, you know, getting more money instead of less. Um, so it is on hold. It it was held. Yeah, and it wasn't held uh, up to until the meeting. It was not on the hold list, but you know, in the midst of the meeting, President Amy said, you know, it's on the hold list. So either he did it or somebody, you know, one of the other commissioners put it on, you know, up there, and I, I really don't know who it was yet, but that was a very interesting day, a couple of days. All right, well, thanks, Barbara. Don, do you want to comment on that for me? Um, yeah, I was just going to report that the item was held this morning. Um, obviously, we're disappointed. This is a program that we were hoping to launch in 2012. We were hoping it would launch in April. Um, we worked very hard with the Energy Division staff to, um, to revise the proposal. Um, your board approved a revised proposal 
on June 20th, which was um, submitted for um, approval through this draft resolution process. So um, we were, of course, very hopeful that it would be approved today. We, were, we had an implementation meeting planned for tomorrow to begin our EE program, but unfortunately, we won't be able to do that um, now. We're hopeful that um, the approval will occur on August 23rd at this time. Um, we encourage folks to come out and support the plan. Um, we think it's important that we get the program started and we do um, plan to grow the program after it starts. Um, the dollar allocation that's um, currently proposed in the draft resolution is over $400,000, and so it will enable us to start a, a very good program which only has a few months left in the year. Um, and we're looking, we'll be discussing later on in the agenda today the more robust program that we'd be launching in the coming uh, two year cycle. Um, I, I can also mention that it was uh, Commissioner Simon's office that requested the poll on the item. Um, I'm not sure. But the reasoning was we heard there was a last minute um, request this morning from an individual who we're not familiar with. So um, we're hoping to find out more about that. And um, hopefully that um, this will get passed through on August 23rd. Okay. Any more members of the public? Kiki. Good evening. Kiki Laporta. Uh, this may be bringing coals to Newcastle, but I was asked by Strategic Energy Innovations to um, let people know in the municipal government and institutional sectors in Marin about the seed grant funding for solar um, <coughs> inspection, assessment, and um, installation. So I'm letting you know, and they are very interested in contacting any agencies that schools as well to go forward. Thank you. Yeah, Senator Fell is utilizing that and it looks like a very promising grant program. Stan. <coughs> Hi, Stan Sparrow from General. Um, I went to the solar conference um, a couple weeks ago and I want to invite you guys there. It had one of the largest conferences in San Francisco and maybe 25,000, 30,000 people, and um, why I thought we in clean energy would be good there is all the largest solar companies in the world were represented there, and uh, a lot of amazing information. Now, the big news is that the price of solar panels has now crossed the threshold that it will be cheaper than PG&E and uh, less than a dollar a watt for the panels themselves. And then they had a big sale, and I got a, um, I sent you an email, 80, 80 cents per watt for Taiwan solar panels. So they're really, really coming down in price. And a lot of new technologies that was really amazing. And um, I wanted to send some of that information to you uh, that would really help learn clean energy of some of the solar technology that's coming up for some arrays in the rain. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other public comment? Okay. Item three, report from Executive Officer Don. Great. So in the interest of keeping this meeting as short as possible, and we were planning not to have an August meeting, and I apologize in advance. Um, I know folks are eager to get home and watch the Olympics, so um, I will keep this very short. Um, I first wanted to introduce Ashley, who's joined us as an intern this summer and has been helping with so many things. Um, welcome, Ashley. We're really excited to have you with us. Uh, um, you all might be hearing from uh, Ashley from time to time with um, requests and uh, meeting coordination and that sort of thing. Um, I also wanted to just, as far as logistics go, we no longer need a bathroom key when we're um, here on the first floor of the evening. So no need to grab a key there. You can just um, help yourself and, and we don't have to go through that anymore. I think it, that may not apply in the daytime, but yeah. Um, and then the, there are two other kind of business items. Is that the start of the energy efficiency program? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I wanted to report on two business items. One is that um, we, we are working with pg &E regarding the PCI checks that will be issued to all customers in, it's supposed to be at the end of August, and there's been some 
back and forth about what's the best way to apply those credits to customers. And at this time, it looks like the approach that's going to be used is mailing checks to, to the customers for the credit. And this is to avoid impacts on the bill that, that um, could occur if the, the charges are netted against MEA charges. There's, uh, pg and &E has a difficulty separating charges on the bill. So um, mailing checks is likely what's going to happen. And I just wanted you all to be aware of that in case you go get questions from constituents um, when those checks come out. I, uh, they're supposed to be issued by the end of August, although I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it took longer than that, given where they are in the process right now. The next thing I wanted to let board members know about, because there's um, been a lot of kind of high-level dialogue about this, we've been working with PG&E really for more than two years to try and change the way that charges are presented on the bill for customers, particularly on the PG&E breakdown of charges, the generation um, or the, um, the unbundled charges really need to be shown on that PG&E page. What happens now is that the um, the bundled rate is shown on, on the PG&E bill for the breakdown, and so customers are not able to recalculate their bill correctly, and it appears that they're being double charged for generation. Um, this is a concern that we raised with PG&E a couple of years ago, and we've been working with them to um, achieve a solution that um, we had been assured would, would be uh, completed through this bill redesign that's underway right now. Um, pg &E filed an advice letter on June 1st um, with a, a very good looking bill that had the uh, bundled charges um, for the unbundled charges showing up for the CCA customer uh, and a, a number of other uh, improvements that make the bill a lot clearer and easier for the customer to read. Um, we supported that advice letter and we, we thought it looked great. Um, but in a meeting with pg &E a week ago, we were told that um, they actually won't be able to um, implement that change. And it looks like the bundle charges um, are going to be showing up on, on the CCA customer's bill um, at the end of this bill redesign. We're concerned because the bill redesign only happens once in a blue moon, and so it's very important that this change be implemented now. Um, so we are um, working with uh, a number of folks um, to try and um, make sure that that change gets rolled into this and we may be um, calling on some of you to participate in meetings with commissioner's offices on this topic. And that is it for my report. What's pg &E's rationale for not making the change? Uh, it's technically too difficult. It would add an additional three months to the timeline for them. And at this point, they feel that the timeline is too essential and, and they are unable to complete it um, from a technical perspective in the way that they expected to um, previously. Any questions for Don? Members of the public? I have, I have a question. Yeah. So, I think, um, can you give us a, a couple of talking points? Because as, as 95,000 of us uh, are, are now enrolled in the uh, Energy Authority in the program Rain Clean Energy, it seems that uh, us as the electeds will get lots of questions from people about bills. And I can't tell you, honestly, the last time I looked at my PG&E bill, because I'm not responsible for that in my household, but I'm going to be. <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm just responsible for paying it. But, uh, <laughs> but I don't have it anymore since I'm a member of, of MCE. But my point is, is that I just think that we're, just as we've had to be ready to answer questions about all the whole opt-out process, being able to decipher the PG&E bill and, and understanding exactly what you're talking about, the unbundled versus bundled on the page, can you just make sure I can I can do that because I know I get a lot of calls and I just want to be able to respond intelligently about that. Thank you. Sure, we'd be happy to do that. And the one thing that I think um, will be helpful and Jamie can send to you is a link to a place on our website that actually shows a bill with um, you know circles around certain places explaining what the different charges yeah. are. Thank you. I just want to be up to speed. Thank you. I know two people who told me that their bills doubled. So if, if this is what they're seeing, um, you know this this really could be serious. Uh, one of the things that is happening supposedly in the in the larger energy efficiency proceedings. Uh, there, you know, the applications for the um, utilities have just been filed, and uh, 
I was looking through the the billing issue is going to come up there also because they're um, the commission has ordered them to um, provide for something called on bill rep repayment financing, um, and they're going to have to do a, a massive redo of their billing in order to accommodate that. Um, they're trying to postpone everything as long as they can, but you know they. Periodically, they're notorious for having bad bills, and I mean, the NEA problems are ridiculous. So, um, and, and they spend an enormous amount of money. So it looks like this is going to come through. I don't know whether the bill redesign that you're talking about is going to happen now, and then they're going to do another one this winter. That would be interesting if that's the case. Um, I'm talking about the one that's planned for this winter. The one that's planned for this winter. Okay, well, then, you know, there's no excuse for this not being in it as far as I'm concerned. And I, think that, I think the purpose of it is to, to make people think their bills have doubled. I mean, I think that's, you know, proactive on PG&E's part, actually. All right, Don, well, why don't you keep us posted on those proceedings, anything we can do uh, to help on that? Sounds like a critical issue. Okay, um, item four, consent calendar. Hopefully everyone had a chance to review it. We do have one change on the minutes. Okay. We have a reference to um, Director Martin instead of Director Small in the minutes. Um, so we call this for that error and we'll fix that. Okay, so we'll note that amendment. Uh, can I have a motion for approval? Move acceptance. Second. Got a motion. Second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That matter, Can I uh, vote yes on everything except the minutes? Yeah. I wasn't there. Okay. That would be noted. Okay, item five, a, uh, a very important item, a very exciting item that's coming back to us. Um, MEA Energy Efficiency Program Implementation Plan for the 2013-14 uh, so we're really excited about this item. Um, I'm going to start and give some introduction to this, and then I'm also going to invite up uh, Jeff Browser, who is in the audience and has been assisting us with some of the development of this plan. Um, but uh, just to kick it off here, we've been discussing energy efficiency really since we launched MEA, and, and the reason why is that it's a way to achieve greater greenhouse gas reductions um, and uh, decrease energy usage, and it provides uh, benefits also to customers. And, being able to save save money at the same time that they're um, saving energy and helping the environment. Um, we have um, offered a couple of things already um, along the lines of energy efficiency. We've offered energy efficiency rebates um, for customers that are participating in the Energy Upgrade California program, and we'd like to do more of that. We are we've been interested in receiving an allocation of energy efficiency dollars that are already being collected from our customers as a non-bypassable charge and use them to have a, a local program that's really tailored to local needs and is able to achieve some results um, in our community. So in January of this year, we brought a plan forward to the board for approval, which included a number of components. Um, one of the components was a, a multifamily program, and uh, some of the other components um, were uh, stripped out of that plan initially, but they've been um, brought back into this um, the plan that we're going to be discussing today. Um, the legislative mandate is um, important to spend a minute on because there are actually two pieces of the statute that um, provide a different uh, path for how a CCA can apply for energy efficiency funds. The first path was um, created through AB 117, which is the um, piece of legislation that enabled CCA programs in California. And um, it's, uh, the reference is 381.1, this is Public Utilities Code 381.1, uh, subsection A. And this permits CCA programs to apply to become administer administrators of cost-effective energy efficiency programs. And the word apply is important. It means that we actually need to submit an application to the commission. It's then subject to protest by other parties, um, uh, a lot of back and forth, and uh, then the commission will vote on whether to approve the plan or not. 
It's a, it's a cumbersome process but uh, a more uh, time-consuming process, but it does allow us to offer energy efficiency programs to anyone in our jurisdiction, even if they're not a customer of, of marine clean energy. It also even allows us to offer programs outside of our jurisdiction. That's something that we're not currently interested in doing, but it's interesting to note that that's, that's uh, available to us. The second course of action um, that is defined in the statute is Public Utilities Code 381.1, Section E and F. Um, these were added on through SB 790, which is a piece of legislation that MEA supported uh, uh, during the last legislative cycle and just went into effect in January of this year. This code reference allows CCAs to apply, uh, I'm sorry, to elect to become administrators of energy efficiency programs. Electing to become an administrator of an EE program is a much simpler process. It, um, it simply requires submitting a board approved plan to the, um, to the CPUC for approval. And all that is needed for approval is a resolution to be voted on by the commission. That is precisely the action that was um, planned to happen today. And so our, our, um, these, these two paths are important to keep in mind because they explain the two different types of plans that our board has approved. The first plan that we approved was for 2012. And this plan was using subsection E and F, to where we, whereby we would elect to uh, administer an EE program only for marine clean energy customers. That's the plan that is currently pending before the commission and will hopefully be voted on by uh, on August 23rd. We're not going to spend any more time talking about that plan tonight, uh, except I will say it's really just focused on multifamily programs. Do you want to at least address the one issue that was raised tonight about funding level on that plan? Sure, I can address that, um, and I'll, I'll address that right now. There was a lot of um, there's a lot of back and forth with the energy division uh, and PG&E, and um, a lot of uh, analysis of data, looking at our our usage, our overall customer usage, to determine what would be the fair allocation of dollars for this 2012 program. Um, it was very difficult for. Um, <coughs> for the CPUC Energy Division to get the data that they needed from PG&E, and it was very difficult for, for um, them to use that data to uh, develop a, an exact percentage breakdown. Um, they provided us with numbers um, based on the analysis of their legal division and, and their technical folks, um, kind of based on their interpretation of the statute, but there was not a formal process that defined how much CCA should be able to um, receive on a going forward basis. It was really a process that was um, being viewed as a, um, a, a, an initial start to the program. Um, and so we conformed to what the energy division uh, requested in hopes that we could launch a program in 2012. If we had um, pushed back hard on the numbers that were being provided to us and requested more, it would have um, caused uh, a good deal of delay and we uh, would not have been able to launch a program in 2012. Um, we also felt that the, the dollar allocation um, was a good fit with an initial start of a program for multifamily. So, um, that just gives a little background on the process. I, I think the, the last thing I'll say on that front, though, is that um, there is certainly uh, a great opportunity to spend a lot more time talking about this uh, with the CPC and the other interested parties to determine what the fair allocation of dollars should be. There has been no, uh, we are not agreeing to any um, formal process that would um, be in place on a going forward basis. We're simply um, looking to start a program and um, we are hopeful that after that has occurred and we have a, a, a strong program that we can point to that has some <coughs> results, that um, we will then be in a great position to um, uh, go through the analytical process and, and possibly um, uncover additional dollars that we should have access to. Um, so now I'm going to shift gears and talk about the plan that we submitted for 2013-2014, and that's really the focus of the presentation today. So this plan was submitted under the um, more time-consuming path, 
And this is uh, under um, PU code 381.1A, which allows us to apply to become administrators of EE programs for all customers in our jurisdiction. And as I said, we could apply for customers beyond our jurisdiction, but we're not doing that. Uh, but we are interested in serving customers who may have opted out of the Marine Clean Energy Program, uh, but could still be served by our energy efficiency programs. Next slide. Oh, can you go back one? Oh, you can't. Um, I want to talk for a moment about the Julie Fitch ruling on slide four. So there was a, a, a ruling issued on June 20th that directed CCAs who are interested in receiving funding for 2013-2014 to apply through a, um, a process that had been defined for regional energy networks, which was kind of a, a process set up for local governments to apply to administer EE programs. Um, in this ruling, she uh, requested that proposals be submitted by July 16th, so there was a very short turnaround in developing this proposal and getting it submitted on time. Um, as a result, we were unable to bring a final version of the plan to your board prior to submittal, and that's why we're spending some time tonight to um, uh, go through the plan with you and, um, and explain what it, aimed, what it includes. Um, and I think we can skip through slide five. This just gives a de some detail on what the CPC um, requires. Um, but I'd like to get into talking about our, um, well, let's see, slide six. We just as a recap, for the, the 2012 EE funding period, we are, um, that, that um, proposal was submitted a while back, and I think we can move on to slide seven. So now we can get into the, the nuts and bolts of what is included in the plan. This is the exciting part. So we have two different elements in the plan, the direct service element and the financing element. And this may sound familiar because we talked about doing this way back in, um, February, um, but it's become a lot more uh, fleshed out and has a lot more detail. So the direct service element includes a multifamily subprogram where we would be uh, providing services in multifamily facilities, um, doing audits and retrofits and uh, proposing measures that could be um, modified to achieve energy efficiency in those um, facilities. Then we also have a focus for small commercial where we're really looking at um, restaurants and professional buildings and uh, small retail. And we're working with um, some vendors that have a lot of expertise in those areas. And we also have a, a lot of um, partners that have um, been expressed an interest and worked with us in developing the proposal. And I think that will um, help assure a really robust implementation process. We're really engaged with the community, um, working with um, local workforce training programs, working with folks at the Marin City Community Development Corporation um, who have uh, a lot of um, direct connections with, um, with folks that may end up being served by these programs. We're really excited about that. Um, and then moving on to the single family component. Here we're going, we're actually gonna get into detail on this one. Um, because we have some interesting graphics here, but, but here we want to provide some software, web-based tools, and also some community, um, really grassroots-based tools that encourage behavior change in single-family homes. And this really um, will bolster the Energy Upgrade California program that already exists. It will also bolster the, um, the um, Lynn County program that exists, the uh, Energy Watch program and it will um, really be looking at uh, residential customers to encourage them to take action and reduce the amount of energy that they consume, help them save money, um, and also help them uh, work towards the, the results that they have in their mind, whether it be greenhouse gas reduction, or cost savings, um, or comfort, you know, making their house more comfortable. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. The second element is the financing element, and this financing element really is a method to help the, um, the direct service element components um, succeed and uh, be able to be financed. So what's being contemplated here is an on-bill repayment program, and uh, we'd be doing that by um, placing charges on our bill to help customers pay off the cost of the upfront cost of energy efficiency upgrades. And then the other program listed here is a standard offer pilot program. <laughs> This, this would be less hands-on, but would be operated similar to a feed-in tariff program, where we put a price out there saying, hey, we're gonna buy energy efficiency uh, uh, from a vendor, and they bid into us, and uh, then they actually um, implement, and once they've achieved the savings, then um, we can uh, 
cover the, the cost um, once they deliver those to us. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the program. Um, you can move on to slide eight. And I'll just make a couple of comments about uh, these programs. The multifamily program is really targeting the, an underserved market sector, and that's important to the commission. I think it's also important to our board. As I mentioned, we'll be collaborating with a number of local partner organizations. And if you have an opportunity to flip through the, the EE plan, it's, I apologize, it's over 100 pages, but um, there is some great information there um, about the partners that we'll be working with. And I, I won't go into it now because it would actually take quite a bit of time, but we have, uh, in many of these subsections of this plan, we have a list of no less than 20 partners um, that are really interested in, in working with us and um, helping to spread the word about this program. The Small Commercial Program is a multi-measure program. We'll be looking at um, doing multiple things at, at, at one time uh, when we go into these units, um, looking at HVAC, looking at windows, insulation, light bulbs, and water conservation. It's been um, important to the CPC, and we're very aligned on this front that we'd like to look at water um, measures at the same time that we're looking at energy um, measures. And we're really going to work to try to target high energy use segments here, including restaurants, retail, and professional services, um, neither of which, I think both the small commercial and the multifamily, is really an underserved um, segment of the population as far as energy efficiency goes. We've really spent most of our efforts in Marin County over the last 10 years focusing on public buildings and government facilities and schools. So getting into these sectors is really exciting. Uh, then on to slide nine, uh, a little bit more on the single family program. Um, really here targeting behavior changes and appliance upgrades using education and outreach tools. Jeff is going to spend a little more time talking about this. He has a lot of experience with the program that they've been piloting and operating up in Sonoma County. Um, and it's, it's really, um, they're doing a great job up there. It's really exciting. So I'm going to turn it over to you in just a minute, Jeff. The last thing I'll say is that um, in the financing element, um, the, uh, the focus on on-bill repayment we, we think will be a, a great way to help, you know, once we come up with a, a list of measures that a, a home or business could choose to, to implement, they'll actually have an option to, um, to cover the cost if they don't want to pay the upfront cost themselves. <coughs> um, so we're excited about having that as, a, as an option for customers. It just provides another choice if, if folks want to go that um, So we can move on to the next slide. Um, and Jeff, if you'd like to come up here and sit sure. or stand at the podium or whatever, whatever you're more comfortable with. Can do it either way. So just a little bit more than what from what Don was saying. You know, one of the one of the areas, one of the sub programs which we're going to be focusing on at MEA with the energy efficiency program is is single family. And for single family, we're doing something that really hasn't been done yet. Is that the commission's really um, pointing to as something they desire to do in the state, and we're going to pilot more. And that's helping people change their behavior. And, 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 and also, re and, and by changing their behavior, they can reduce the electrical consumption, which um, retrofits, changing the building show has an effect on it. But studies show, and, 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 a, and a pretty deep study in Sonoma County, that that's, a, that's only 35% of the problem. The other 65% can be solved through behavior and so what we're so what MEA is going to do is utilize technology that's been piloted up in, in Sonoma County, and refine it and uh, make it work down here and, and, and with MEA. And and what it is, it's it's it, we we call it utility demand reduction, because it's not just energy, but it's also water, um, and the combination of water and and energy savings measures to accomplish that. Um, so. What this technology does is there's, there's really three parts of three parts of it that you can see up on the screen, and what the first part is uh, what's called my energy use, and what it what it is is going to enable through a secure sign-in, um, consumers are going to be able to see their energy use, um, and and that's going to be pre-populated pre with property characteristic data that we get from tax assessment data and other uh, climate data sources. And they'll be able to go into that, and they'll be able to update that default information if they want very quickly. And it's going to look at things in their energy use, like the number of people in their home, how they use it in their home, appliance, what their situation is with appliances, cooling and heating equipment, whether they have solar or not. So they're going to answer those questions. And very quickly from that, they're going to get what's called an action plan. 
And the action plan is a list of priorities that are based on um, your personal situation and your desires and your preferences. Um, but, the, but, but the priorities can be based on return on investment for, uh, for, for measures taken. So, so what that means is, is perhaps behavior elements like maximizing the use of your dryer, dryer loads and, and turning off your lights, things like that, that obviously get a very high return on investment with very little or no cost. All the way down to changing solar, which is um, much more expensive, but in many cases you can get a, a big payback. And so what this tool is, it helps optimize all that and it spits out this list of priorities based on your situation. And your, your situation may be, your focus may not be utility demand reduction. It may be, um, I mean, it's utility demand reduction, but it might not be economics. It might be um, information in terms of, you know, you're, you're, you want to reduce carbon, that might be your focus. You might be more interested in health and comfort, which when you, when you make these enhance, enhancements, that obviously helps. Um, so, so this whole program, a combination of the outreach programs and the technology is, is really geared to get people to better understand in a fun way how they can change their behavior. Um, and then the last part is my projects. And what my projects is, is, is you know, through this process, you want to stay engaged with your, with your customer. And with, with existing programs and, and uh, projects that are out there today in energy efficiency, they're, they're going out there, they're maybe doing retrofits and getting financing for that, and then, then you're done with that customer. And what this, this will do is it'll, it'll still help stay engaged with the customer so you can continually offer different services and, and you know, value-added services for that customer. Uh, next slide, please. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. With regard to the My Energy use phase of it, that, doesn't that require a lot of uh, the smart outlets and the smart um, the uh, smart meters, the accessories that, that actually talk to the smart meter? I mean, I, I understood that you have special plugs that you plug your your stove uh, stove into, or you plug your your mixer in that will in some way, otherwise you can't tell that it's the, that, that it's the, the washing machine or the dryer that's using electricity. Right. So there's a whole another, there's a whole interface here, isn't yeah. there? And, you're, and we can talk about this all day, <laughs> but what you're doing is, that's exactly where this program is going, right? I mean, most people don't have a combination of the appliances and the smart meters in place today to do what you're saying, yeah. but this technology will support that. So you actually get full, real reads of, of how the, 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 uh, the, the, your equipment and your appliances are consuming and your lights are consuming energy and you can immediately adjust to that. And part of what this program is gonna do in the future is have a monitoring capability yeah. you know, through a third party application so you can do exactly that. That's a great question. I think we have another question over here. Yeah, I've got a, a definitional question. Your presentation has been predicated on making references to changing behavior. And I think it would be helpful, certainly for me and probably for the people who are looking at this, we hope they are on TV at some point, to define what you're talking about. What kind of behavior to begin with and changing to, to what kind of behavior so that we've got more definition in terms of what yeah. the discussion is. Generally, yes, obviously, that what's connoted is uh, some sort of more efficient behavior that uses less energy. But I think if you could talk a little bit more and fill in that g conclusory term with some actual examples of what you're talking about, yeah, and I, it'd be better. And I'll give more. I, I gave one, and that was maximizing your loads in your laundry. Um, another is maximizing your loads for, for your for dishwashing. Uh, another another is adjusting your thermostat when you're at home and not at home. Same with your lighting. Um, so those are examples of behavior. There's 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 more. Okay. Um, does that? Yeah. Does that, that's bad. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, Follow-on question. <clears throat> How will the consumer measure what they're doing by way of efficiency in terms of dollars? Is is, is there a there would be a website or someplace where they go and they can actually convert that into, I say this many kilowatt, whatever it is, and I say this much money because, you know, people are very 
Yeah, I mean, this, this, the, the, the algorithm, the calculator behind this program actually cranks out, and I'm not the person who developed it, millions of calculations, I'm told, which really, which, 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 do, which really look at all the different factors locally here in Marin. So, you know, and apply those to the different measures that are selected or proposed in your action plan. Um, does that answer your question? The answer is yes. Sir. And, and, it, and it also, it's not just the cost, but also the benefits for the savings. And those benefits goes, go back to California standard databases, like the Deer database, for instance, which, which has standard um, savings for different types of measures. Okay. So you can find it. And all that is in detail in the plan, all the minutia, if, if you care to look at it. Uh, okay, so this is just this is just a slide of the, of the user interface, and I'm not sure if you can see this or not. Um, but it's this this shows you different views and different and I, and I mentioned different people have different preferences. Your preference might be uh, economics, so you might want to reduce flat out. You just want to get the best return on investment for your measures. It may be health and comfort. People don't recognize that they can be much more. They're comfortable in their home without increasing their, their utility costs. Um, it could be uh, it could be uh, green factors, you know, GHG reduction in carbon. A lot of people are interested in that. Or it could be a combination of all of those. So this this uh, tool enables you to, to see these different views of action based on what your preferences are. Okay. And this is just the, the energy use input form, which I already described that. That's uh, there are different ways that you use energy within your house for appliances, for equipment, um, how many people are in your home, you know, how you set your temperatures, the age of your house. And, and a lot of this, again, is pre-populated with default information. And then somebody can go in and adjust those if, if they want to refine them. Any questions on it? Can you explain the time of use for the TV? That's a real important one for the whole thing. The time of use, net, uh, the metering. Yeah, well, that gets back into what we were talking about earlier um, <coughs> and the question earlier about uh, yeah, when you say time of use, you're saying time of use per, per measure? Uh, for billing purposes, uh, the peak time of noon till 6 or 7 o'clock. Yeah. The rate yes. is the yeah. The tiers reflecting the, the tier structure, and this these algorithms and calculation reflect the five tier structure for for PG and E. Um, We've actually um, already begun looking at plugging in our rate structure for our customers into the algorithms um, that they've developed in Sonoma County because, of course, our rate structure is a bit different, um, and the, the tiering doesn't apply on our side of the bill. So. We're starting to swap data to make sure that we have the, the right information. There's also some adjustments that need to be made for net energy metering customers of, of Marine Clean Energy. Um, so that will be included. But um, what's really interesting about the capability is that um, the customer class and the customer rates is actually part of the, the calculations that happen with, with any change that you make, the, um, the rate structure that you are already under. Uh, will be applied and will um, spit out the, the likely savings for, for any measure. Um, so time of use certainly is one thing that would be included if, if you're a time of use customer. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Don, are you going to... Yeah, I just, I just a few more things here. Um, we've listed here some of the program goals, and and I, I think these are... These are useful um, in your discussions with other folks in the community about why this program is important. Um, you know, we really think increasing access to programs by hard to reach customers is a, is a key um, impact that we're gonna be able to achieve. Um, identifying segmented concentrations of customers um, is another area that I, that I think will help the program be successful. We're kind of um, latching on to certain groups that we think we can serve in a, in a similar way and get them engaged. 
the social marketing techniques, I think, are really exciting and have a lot of potential for impact, haven't been used by a lot of the existing utilities, but where they have been used, they've been extremely successful. Um, we've learned a lot from what's happened in Sonoma thus far on that front. And then being able to collaborate with our local community organizations is really exciting as well, because we can tap into resources that are already being spent and leverage those to, um, to make our program really effective. Um, the, the next slide here gives you a sense of the, the overall costs and outcomes. And so you'll see here that our, our TRC, or total resource cost, comes in at 1.44. Um, this exceeds the um, CQC standard, um, <coughs> so we're excited about that. And the, the PAC, the program administrator cost, comes in at 2.14. This is also a, um, a, a good metric. This is a um, programmatic um, an overall programmatic score. We also have calculated TRC and PAC for each sub-program of the program, uh, the overall plan. Um, we can answer questions about that if, if folks are interested, but this is the metric that um, the CPUC and other parties often look at to say, well, gosh, how successful is your program? How, how much money are you spending on it, and how much kilowatt hour savings is coming out based on the money that we're putting in? And it's just to mention, greater than one is what the requirement is. So. Um, the total program budget is just over four million, and that would be spread over a two-year period. The next two slides give you a breakdown of the um, the budget and the savings. You can see how much is being spent in each category. You can see some dollars have been allocated to incentives, um, direct installs. So these are dollars that would flow directly to the customer um, to encourage them to make changes. Um, other. Uh, portions of the funds would go towards education and training, marketing and outreach. Um, and then on the next slide, we have a breakdown by programs. You can see how much is um, allocated for each of the sub-programs, and then what the related kilowatt hour savings would be, and then kilowatt and capacity savings would be. Um, we've also included therms here because um, we'll be implementing multi-measure programs that look at achieving gas savings, um, water savings, as well as electricity savings. So with that, are there any questions on the plan? Correct. Is there a, uh, it's a pretty impressive program, is there a particular staff member that's going to be the, <laughs> the energy efficiency czar of the, of the Marine Clean Energy Program? This is what they're going to, is that you, Don, or is it going to be? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to uh, hand the baton off to someone else on that. We actually established a position last fall, uh, energy efficiency program coordinator. And uh, we chose to leave that position unfilled until we had a funding stream identified to fund that position. So uh, till up until this point, we've been um, handling um, this work internally with existing staff. But we do need to um, uh, fill that position. And, uh, and then we will have a EV program coordinator. Has, that position has not yet been filled, um, as the dollars have not yet been allocated. But we're hopeful that we can do that at the end of the month. Uh, director. This is a rather big bite. Uh, for our organization. Do you think that we need to jump into all of it at one time, or would it be better to do what, maybe multifamily first? Because I thought there was some discussion at some point that the, the commercial was a, was a particularly difficult thing to do. So what are we going to jump into all of it at one time? Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't think, I don't recall discussion about commercial commercial being difficult, but I think you're raising a, a great point, and um, the kind of the thinking behind our revised 2012 plan was to do just that, to walk before we run, to start with the multifamily program, get the team together, um, get our programs um, up and running, and then um, uh, launch this more robust plan. Um, I think that the, the, the the difficulty with launching a small program is that you still have overhead costs that really reduce your TRC and PAC numbers. And uh, we found that to be true with our 2012 plan. It was very difficult to have a really compelling number there when you're going through startup and launch of a program that's only going to last for four months. And it's hard to achieve results in that time frame um, when you have to interface with customers and get projects completed. Um, so launching a small program can actually um, be more difficult because um, there are some economies of scale. Um, there are certainly a lot more components we could have added on to this, um, but I chose not to. I think that we've kept it um, 
at a very good level for a two-year plan. Um, it gives us plenty of room to um, get involved in a number of different sectors in energy efficiency. We also didn't want to set a precedent at the beginning for um, requesting a small amount of dollars. Really, the way that the statute is written, we are supposed to be allocated um, the funds that are collected from customers um, in a, through Vietnam bypassable charges. And so we didn't want to ask for a portion of those because that would um, that would mean that the remaining dollars still live with PG&E to administer. It's, it's uh, simpler to kind of have a clean approach where we either pg and administering the program or we are administering the program. So the, the program administrator costs that you're dividing amongst the different programs could actually be one person or well, fewer or something that you couldn't really easily divide. Yeah. The program administrator cost will include one, probably one and a half internal staff positions at the beginning. Um, we will also be contracting with quite a few different vendors. Um, the primary vendor that we've been working with on this um, program is REMS. They're uh, based in Marin City and um, they will be handling much of the audit and retrofit work on small commercial and multifamily. Um, we will also be contracting with um, Richmond Build and uh, several other organizations that will provide um, uh, services to us on a um, vendor basis. You don't have to explain this to us now, but is there a metric that you have considered as to determine whether or not this program is successful or not, and when would you be applying that metric? I don't need you to go through all the details, but just so that like a year or two years from now we find out whether or not this program is really worth the time, effort, and resources that we're devoting to it. Yeah, there are pretty strict guidelines around evaluation and measurement and verification of results, and we plan to conduct that on an annual basis. And we'll be reporting that to the board. The CPC will also be interested in seeing um, how, how we perform. Okay. And if I could mention one thing, when you talk about economies of scale, there's also the marketing and outreach programs, there's technology, and, and both of these, both of those are going to stretch across all, all the sub programs, and that's where the really economies of scale come in at. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and there's some innovative outreach programs like working with schools, working with employers. You know, that, that can affect each of these sub programs. And as far as the technology goes, part of this technology also um, aggregates the data in the back end. So, you know, all the results you know, positive or negative of each of these programs, that will be fed into the, the, this aggregated data to be reported on back to um, the program, to adjust your campaigns, to, to go before the board, to go before the CPUC, et cetera. Director Collins. A couple of questions. And Don, how many, how many units, how many homes are we talking about here in, in, on this in this project for 2013? Yeah, gosh, that's a great question. Um, we, I can look at the plan to give you an exact number, but I think the ballpark is about 150. Um, but I can't recall if that was an annual or a um, total program. But that detail is certainly in the body of the plan. And then how much per home is the average amount? The, how much of the budget? Well, how, how much is allocated per home? Yes, how much budget? How much is allocated per home? Three counts, yeah, on average. In other words. How much are we advancing? Huh. You know, that's a calculation we haven't done, but I guess a ballpark would be probably about $400 per home on average. But I need to, I need to uh, do a little. And then that's the amount that would be paid back on the bill. No. Okay. I think you're asking a different question. So, so maybe what you're asking is how much would the cost be for an average retrofit for yes, a home? Yeah. How much would the customer's cost be? Okay. Um, typically, what we see is uh, a range of measures would be proposed to a customer. Let's say we're talking about a residential customer. So, um, after an audit is complete, um, there would be a proposal that um, you could uh, swap out your insulation could do caulking, some low-cost things, or you could move into the mid-cost range of windows um, uh, being swapped out and, and more expensive things, or you could go to something uh, super expensive. And so I think that the, the range of um, measures averages from $500 to $10,000 for something that's really comprehensive that includes HVAC, for example. Would be a limit on it, like, say, $10,000? 
Is there a limit? I mean, no, the limit really is what the customer's appetite is for making changes. So we're going to give them a laundry list, and then we will give them their, the, um, the mechanism of on-bill financing. Now, there is a limit on the on-bill financing. Um, we, we will, our approach is to only um, put charges on the bill that allow the customer to be paying at or below what their uh, typical monthly average cost would be. Uh, this is important for the banks because they want some assurances that the customer will be able to continue paying the bill. Um, if the customer wants to pay for uh, some additional cost of the upgrade themselves beyond what's covered on, on, in the on-bill financing, they could certainly choose to do that. There's no limitation. So the bank is financing the customer is paying on the bill. The customer uh, leaves town to have You mean it doesn't pay the bill? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, those are some of the mechanics that we'll be working out with, with PG&E, but the way things are currently structured is that um, if the customer, um, any payments that the customer makes are allocated proportionately to the PG&E side of the bill and the MEA side of the bill. If the customer doesn't pay, they receive a notice from us after a 90-day period and we eventually um, terminate them and send them back to PG&E. But what happened in the case of an on-bill financing charge being uh, tied to that bill, um, it would be handled by the bank and the customer directly. So it's likely that there would need to be an agreement in place um, between the bank and the customer that would handle that scenario. And that hasn't yet been worked out, but we actually have become discussions with banks that looked at the We're not same in that We are not involved. Back here. No, we would not be providing that financing from our balance sheet. It would come from a bank. And, and, and the banks are very attracted to on-bill repayment because um, the the, uh, the rate of people that don't pay their bills is, is much lower than a typical loan. And that's one, one of the reasons it's attractive. If you like to go out and don't pay your rent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's that's pretty good. Good. Yeah. Talk about it. Yeah. Don, you mentioned the uh, standard offer method of uh, financing as well. Is that being currently being implemented anywhere? Um, not in California, but it is being implemented in Texas and in the New England ISO. And um, so we'd be using um, the existing programs in those two areas as a model for what we would implement here on a small scale. And we'd also be reaching out to vendors that uh, currently engage and participate in that market there and, and bid. Um, in on, on, uh, on that program to see if they'd be interested in bidding in on our program. Um, we, I think it's worth mentioning that this this is one part of the program that we clearly define as a pilot. Um, we need to see how it's going to work in California. We don't have an ISO that is running this program, so we don't really have a market for it in California per se. Um, but we may be able to um, launch a program that is a win-win for us and the vendor and the, um, the, the eventual end user. Um, but that remains to be seen, so we want to pilot it and uh, see how it works. I think it's a tremendous program. I really hope it has great legs. It's really good. You guys did a tremendous really good work on this. Uh, good job. Any further board comments or questions? How about members of the public? Energy efficiency and plan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to take the board's time, but I'm very interested in, in learning about your um, program in Sonoma and how it works and how long it's been going. And with behavior change, we know that um, does it stick over time? And um, so I can either connect with you separately, or if you have some comments about that now, that would be great. The one thing I'll say is when you look at the three components, the third component is exactly what you say: is staying in touch with the customer. Um, and which is not typical of programs, and that's one of the reasons why Sonoma doesn't have a lot of history. I mean, it's, it's young. This program was just uh, piloted beginning of January, so there's not a lot of historical information there. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the these tools, we believe, will engage consumers and continue to enable MEA to stay in touch with consumers. That's true. Um, you all probably know that I'm working on a program through Sustainable Marin uh, with Town Peters called Resilient Neighborhoods, and we're doing the, <clears throat> the hands-on, boots-on-the-ground version of that without the software and the technology enhancement. So there may be some, some, some opportunity for collaboration. Uh, I mean, and, and that's part of what I think Don even suggested that we start out with the pilot program, um, and uh, that's it. And I think you suggested the resilient neighborhoods. 
Yeah, in fact, we have a meeting roughly in the back there. Yeah. 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 We already set up a meeting with Brazilian neighborhood and I'll plan it with this. Thank you. I think there's two ways to look at this. One, one is that we're moving forward quickly and maybe we'll get the program up and running a little sooner rather than later. And, but you need to understand this is a really, really big fight, the energy efficiency fight. It's gonna, you know, I'm sorry to say, it's, it's ridiculous, but um, people have been on the board for a while and people like in Nevada realize that, you know, this is how PG fought. CCA. This is really, as I say to a lot of people, this is where the bodies are buried. And I got a comment from, from Loretta Lynch, who was the former president of the PUC, who tried to develop independent programs. She put a, uh, you know, four years of, of $50 million on the table for independent programs. They all, every single one of them, you know, I should say, 49 out of 50 save more energy per dollar than the utilities. All 49 brand new programs. The utilities have been running programs for 30 years. So, uh, you know, as far as whether or not we can do a better program than PG&E, absolutely we can do a better program than PG&E. Almost anybody could do a better <laughs> program than PG&E. Um, but I, you know, I really want to caution you that the way this has moved forward at the commission is um, they violated all their own processes, and that, and there's going to be no pay for that, frankly. Um, and it, it could have been done, you know, all out of the regular process, you know, which was the, the 2012 program was pretty much left, you know, it all happened in the back room, which I don't think is a great idea, but on the other hand, sometimes at the commission, you know, it's like, okay, otherwise you're going to have to go through the processes. What has happened with the Jody Fitch ruling on the 2013-14 plan, um, she put everything backwards. She basically said, here, you can um, you can um, put in a proposal in less than a month. I mean, cities, and, and you know, we had absolutely no time for input on this, no time to discuss it. I mean, thank goodness that Dawn was prepared in many ways, and so she was ready to move forward, and thank you, Jeff, for coming in and, and being available to do this. But, that is an outrage, in my opinion, to um, force us to, you know, to put a, a, a huge, I mean, it's 150 pages. Um, and, uh, and there's no time for input, for public input. Um, there's no time, and, and the public input, the process allows for people to get interested and excited about it. It's, you know, the utilities take enormous amounts of time to put their, um, you know, to have their program, you know, they get, program advisory groups and you know so there's a lot of opportunities for input but I just want to tell you that there what has happened since they put you know they said here um, CCAs um, you can put a proposal in and then we're going to consider them all together so we are considering in the proceeding now um, the utilities thousands of pages of utility proposals you know these regional energy networks um, and, and the CCA proposals, and they wanted to get them all together. Well, I think that would have been a great idea, and I don't know why Commissioner Farron didn't do it that way, and that's something that I hope the board will take that up with Mr. Farron, is like, why weren't we CCAs in the May decision? Why were we an afterthought? Because what we had in the utilities, um, all of them filed very nasty comments on the 2012 plan. And they, um, they brought up all of these irregularities. And the irregularities going forward in the 2013-14 plan are even greater. Uh, because this thing has been pushed through. And you know, the, the ruling says, OK, parties will have it. You know, we're going to have these, these applications. But then parties are going to have a chance to give us comments after it's all done, after these are all in. So what that does is leave us open to all kinds of attacks. And maybe the commission is well-intentioned and they really want to move us forward, or maybe they want to really screw us up. I mean, you know, this, this could be looked at in either way, but just get, get ready to fight for the money. And, uh, you know, this is a, um, you know, this is gonna be a, a major fight. And, you know, I understand we've got people waiting, you know, who are ready to start the program and we should do it, but already, I mean, in the back room of the 2012 program, they took out the small commercial program 
the multifamily program, the utilities are saying that is not cost effective and that's illegal. Because we only have one program now. If that's not cost effective, we're in trouble. And so this is the kind of thing when, when they hurry you up like this, um, you're, you're going to have problems. And, um, you know, so I, I just want to read this little comment from the Loretta Lynch. The Barbara, let's, uh, if you get wrapped, I think we yeah. fully get your point. I okay. actually have a follow-up question for Don. So 30 more seconds. Okay, well, I, just, I completely agree with Barbara that energy efficiency is where many of the bodies are buried and one of the places where the PUC and the utilities game the system against CCAs. I also agree that the PUC has pulled this 15% limitation out of nowhere and that it is not required by statute. However, MEA as a party does, if MEA does not consistently fight the 15%, especially in this precedent setting decision, then it will go down as the law forevermore with the utilities keeping CCAs in their small little box for business as usual. This is a very important decision on many, many fronts and it deserves to be fought vigorously. Thank you. Um, Don, give us a sense of the uh, review process, the timing going forward with the PUC on 013 14. Sure. So the plan was submitted on July 16th. Reply comments were due um, about two weeks after that. Um, PG&E, Southern California Edison, um, uh, and SDG&E all filed comments. Um, um, in protest of the plan that we have filed um, and replies to their uh, comments were due last week and we submitted uh, reply comments. Um, the, I'm sorry, you actually said July 16th, which was the 2013-14 plan, so the 2012 plan was submitted. No, I'm asking like about 13-14, we already yeah, talked 14, about no, okay, 12 well, I think you're getting those mixed I, up. Um, no, you're right. I am mixing up the two. Yeah, okay. which is easy to do. Yeah, it's easy to do. So uh, as far as the, the um, 013, 014 plan goes, the um, the comments due back on that should be, I believe they're coming out tomorrow, and then we will be uh, needing to respond to those by, uh, the, by Monday the 13th. Um, and then we have already begun holding ex-party meetings with each of the commissioner's offices on the, the 013 and 14 plan, um, which um, uh, one of our directors, Director Sears, participated in the first one. Thank you very much. And we have two more coming up on the 13th um, that we'll have Director Connolly participating in. Um, if you're interested in being part of the next party meeting, let us know. We'll have lots of opportunities for that in the next couple of weeks. Um, in addition to the comments being filed by the IOUs and then the counter uh, comments being filed by us, the ex party dialogue will be really important. Um, the date for the um, for a decision to come out on this is um, not yet firm, but it's expected to be sometime in the October November time frame. Okay. All right, well, good discussion. Um, any further questions or comments? Is, is this an action item? No, this is this is for a discussion only. Okay. All right, great. Item six, um, agreement with CAPCO Worldwide. All right, I'll be introducing this item with a few comments and then later on um, I'm going to introduce two representatives who we invited to join us tonight from AFCO Worldwide who will be discussing uh, the proposal that they have offered for MEA. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to offer was congratulations to everyone for the completion of our phase 2B enrollments. Uh, it was a long time coming, and it took a whole lot of work from everyone in this room and also people who aren't here tonight. So it's a really exciting time. With the close of July, uh, we've successfully offered service to everyone in Marin County, and we've grown our customer base by almost seven times. So I think it's a really great accomplishment. And uh, with the completion of our expansion, we can now begin preparing for enrollment in Richmond, uh, which would happen in 2013. Um, moving along into Richmond is really gonna result in a changing landscape for all of us here, uh, as far as marine clean energy is concerned. Before we ever began uh, providing service in Marin, we conducted research, that was in early 2010, to determine um, public interest and opinion related to electricity, and that was really valuable to us. It ended up forming the basis for our messaging that we still use today. Uh, what we took from that survey uh, was 
that we needed to focus our communications on providing cleaner energy for a healthier environment at affordable costs and without compromising reliability through our partnership with PG&E. Uh, with our recent growth and our expected growth in Richmond, uh, we're facing new challenges as far as communications are concerned, and it really requires us to reassess our messaging and our tactics um, with our, our new current customer base and our future customer base. We want to make sure that we can communicate effectively with customers. Our goal has always been to be as tra transparent as possible by providing uh, clear and easy to, to understand information for all of our potential customers about our program so that they had all of the information necessary to make the best decision for them about whether or not they wanted to choose marine clean energy. Um, with that goal in mind and uh, the period of transition in mind that, that we're in and we'll be entering into over the next several months, now is really an ideal time to reassess our um, communication strategy and our messaging uh, with our new customer base. And just with that introduction, I'd like to pass it along to our executive officer to talk about next steps for that process. Yeah, so um, because we wanted to find the most effective ways to communicate with customers, we conducted several interviews with companies that provide um, public relations strategy services and um, market research, which um, was uh, we, we viewed as uh, very important at this juncture. We conducted in-depth interviews with APCO Worldwide, uh, BMWL, a company that um, we've worked with in the past, um, and Manifest Marketing um, and PR company. Um, and we um, received proposals from all of these companies um, in addition to the, the in-depth interviews. Um, we were particularly struck by the professional expertise of the APCO team, particularly in relationship to the energy industry. And this is really important because energy is a kind of a cumbersome, maybe even convoluted uh, topic to communicate. And being able to do that in a, a clear and compelling way with customers is um, really important. And um, we're, we're hoping to um, uh, learn a lot and, and uh, build off of the expertise that they've gained. They've actually provided services to a number of um, uh, folks really key to the energy sector in California, including Kaiso um, and uh, some of the IOUs, actually. So I'll let them talk about that um, when they come up. But um, we're, we're really excited about the um, experience in the energy sector. We were also um, struck by the, the deep experience that they have in conducting market research. and. Um, their ability to do it in-house. Um, some of the firms that we spoke to tend to farm that out and then uh, you know, bring that information back in-house to um, develop um, uh, suggestions and, and recommendations. But um, APCO Worldwide does this in-house and has developed a, um, a very um, well thought through approach to the market research that we think is very holistic, comprehensive, and, and we produce um, an excellent array of, array of quantitative information. Um, so that's why we've invited APCO to be with us tonight, and um, we've already begun working with them uh, on a small contract. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but this is for <coughs> hourly services that they've been providing to us over the last few weeks. Um, we're excited to, to talk about the market research tonight that they'd be able to provide to us. Um, and before they come up, I, I just wanted to say a few things about why this is being brought forward at this time. There is, um, quite a bit of discussion about this in our executive committee meeting several weeks ago. Um, and for those of you who didn't have the benefit of, be, of being at that meeting, I wanted to recap some of the ideas and, and the thoughts that came out of that. Um, one of the things that was identified as being really important is coming up with quantitative information. A lot of the communications that we do with customers now is um, is based on qualitative information. And so, you know, we, we might look at what's been in the IJ lately in the editorials, what the customers that come into our office are saying, um, but the, the communications approach um, is not tailored to any specific quantitative data um, that we can use to, to inform um, our messaging and <clears throat> our methods of communicating with, with customers. Um, the, so that's really the, you know, one of the reasons behind the, the, um, the thinking on this. <coughs> I think it's worth noting that the proposed cost of the contract with APCO Worldwide, it's certainly a significant contract, 
um, as far as the cost goes, but it amounts to um, two tenths, less than two tenths of 1% of the annual MEA budget. Um, and is also likely to pay for itself through customer retention and an increase in the number of well-informed, satisfied customers that will talk to their neighbors and spread the word um, and uh, improve the reputation of uh, burning clean energy and, and those that are associated with it. Um, also, um, I, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about other agencies that use market research to gain quantitative information. Um, this is certainly not new. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, through your work with local governments. Um, but we've highlighted a, three, a few and included in your supplemental packet some market, market research that was performed um, in Sonoma County and in the city and county of San Francisco, specifically related to CCA efforts. There is also market research performed um, commonly by um, government agencies that's just general um, customer or uh, in, in a local government's case, um, really looking for public feedback to help with policy setting. Sonoma County spends just over 100,000 on general polling efforts on an annual or biannual basis. The County of Marin spent 53,000 on its most recent general poll of constituents. Um, and the Marin County Parks and Recreation actually conducted a recent poll um, that was uh, 28,000 um, to determine public interest on some relevant topics. As far as CCA specific polling, um, Jamie touched on the polling that we did uh, back, back a couple of years ago. We haven't done any polling since that time, so we certainly do. Um, in Sonoma, um, approximately $40,000 was spent on CCA-focused polling in 2011. And we've attached um, in your supplemental packet some of the um, results, some of the outcomes of that study. There were two parts to it in the, um, in the report that came out. One was really the, focused on residential, the other was focused on commercial and business outcomes. Um, but they learned a lot from that and are using that information to develop their um, their plan, their implementation plan. Um, I spoke to folks in Sonoma County to, to gauge their um, uh, the, the value that they felt that this um, process offered and um, they certainly felt that it was extremely valuable, really essential in helping them um, identify um, the development of their program and the, their methods of communicating with the public. The city and county of San Francisco spent uh, just over $100,000 on CCA market research, and we've included um, some of the results in your packet here. Um, a couple of things that I think are worth pointing out in this um, study, just to give a sense of what sort of information you can glean. Um, what they found is that customers, for the most part, or members of the public, really like PG&E. And this was something that we found out when we did our initial polling. It's not something that um, was intuitive to us. Um, and wasn't what, what we were hearing from folks and I'm in, the, in the editorials and the customers walking in even, um, we don't hear that so much, but I um, mean the polling you can get at information um, in a you know, quantitative way. So um, that, that information was, uh, it looks like that same information was identified in San Francisco um, that was identified in, uh, uh, in Marin. Um, and I'm, if you all wanna um, take a look at the where that's located. I'm looking at the um, San Franciscans' attitudes towards clean power SF. Um, this is um, slide 11, so they, they do a, uh, an analysis. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting is how much more folks are willing to pay um, to become, a, to, to be a customer of a green program. And um, they were able to really, with a um, pretty good breakdown, give a feel for how um, how, how far will folks go and also which customers are willing to pay more. So um, the, what they found is that um, customers um, that have a higher income uh, tend to be willing to pay a bit more. Um, they also found a, a high correlation between age and um, interest in the in power as that program. Um, the, the younger um, folks that were um, that were interviewed were more interested in paying more, and the um, folks that are older in the population um, were far less interested in participating in, in the um, Green Power SF program. So these are, this is the kind of data that um, can be gleaned from a marketing effort, certainly is valuable in, in as far as um, determining where to spend communication dollars, um, uh, what, what communications um, methods work best, and what kinds of um, information customers need to get about the program. 
Um, the last comment I'll make on, on some of the, the benefits that we discussed, um, this type of um, market research can also be quite helpful in our discussions with um, financial institutions as we um, go forward with achieving a credit rating and um, bond insurance. <coughs> for the uh, financial um, entities want to know what what is the public sentiment? What do customers really want? How do customers really feel about the agency? And how do, um, qualitative data doesn't work so well with, with the bank, but having quantitative information um, can really um, be quite helpful in those discussions. Um, so um, with that, I'd like to um, turn it over. I think that um, Jeff, uh, Jamie is going to introduce our co team. Sure, great. Um, well, I'd like to tr introduce Jessica Sheehan and Jose Amasio, who are both here today from ACO. You're welcome to come on up. Um, Jose is the Managing Director of AFCO's Sacramento office and has represented municipal and investor-owned utilities as well as the California Independent System Operator. And uh, Jessica is the Associate Director in AFCO's Sacramento office and assists clients in the utilities and energy sector with communication planning. Thank you both so much for coming. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'll kick this off. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us here tonight. We're excited to have the opportunity to talk about our company and uh, talk about our ideas for how to do the research. Um, so we can skip that slide. Um, a quick word about the company. Uh, we were founded 28 years ago. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have uh, about 30 offices around the world. Three of them are on the West Coast. Uh, Seattle, Sacramento, and San Francisco. Uh, we just have more than 600 employees at the present time, and we are independently owned. In fact, we're one of the world's largest independently owned public affairs and public relations companies. Uh, we also are a certified woman-owned company. Uh, I'm sure you can't read this on the screen, although I understand you do have this information in your packet. Uh, but this shows you the range of services we offer. Uh, we're a full-service firm, and Don already mentioned that uh, we provide research services in-house. Uh, the next slide, I think, uh, says a few things about our research arm, which we call AFCO Insight, basically is a research firm within our firm. Uh, we have uh, somebody on a team on the West Coast, uh, but the team for the most part is based in Washington, D.C. In fact, uh, the, the people who would work with you um, the research program are, are located in Washington, D.C., which is why we're here tonight representing them uh, instead of having them come out from Washington to talk in detail about the program. Although we can do that, Jessica's going to walk through that approach in a second. Uh, the very last bullet says that we do work for, uh, you know, uh, eight of the Fortune 20 and other Fortune 100 companies. That's true. But I also want to make sure you understand that we do work for other entities as well, smaller companies, uh, public agencies, nonprofits, trade associations, folks like that. I don't know how much we want to really get into in terms of our ex energy experience. I'll just say that we do have uh, a global energy and clean tech practice group. Uh, we have both a North America group and a global group. Uh, Jessica and I are both on the team. Uh, across the network, we have obviously very extensive uh, experience uh, working in all types of energy issues, providing a range of services. Um, if you want me to talk about any of the client work we've done, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but Don did mention that uh, I've done work for Cal ISO. I worked for them during the energy crisis in 2001 and 2002. Uh, we've done a lot of work for municipal utilities. I can get into some detail about that if you'd like, and also uh, JPAs that represent municipal utilities. And we've done a fair amount of work for the um, for the three IOUs in California. Uh, so, you know, and we've done work for the business community on regulatory issues. So, for the types of issues we've done work on is legislative issues, regulatory issues, infrastructure issues, uh, service issues, and other reputational drivers that affect the company's reputation. So with that, I'll hand it off to Jessica. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, members of the board. I know that you have slide actually. I know you have a copy of the proposal in your packets, but we did want to spend a little bit of time tonight walking through our proposed approach and then answering any questions that you may have. Um, so as you'll see here, there are three phases uh, of our approach. The first phase is discovery or the research phase. 
The second phase is alignment. So that's really taking what we learn from the research and then focusing or adapting um, your plans for communications, for customer communications, for community engagement, um, and even your business planning um, to align with the research findings. And then the third phase is the actual engagement phase. So that's how do we increase public understanding of the long-term value of a relationship with MCE? How do we better connect, connect in a more meaningful way with customers and the local communities? So both here in Marin and then looking at um, moving forward um, into Richmond. <coughs> So the purpose of the discovery phase or the research, it really is to identify what is most important to your customers. What is it that they expect from a relationship with MCA, MCE? And how do they think you're currently performing against what they expect or what they most value or find important? What do they perceive as your strengths and what do they view as your weaknesses? So that again, we can learn from that and adopt communications as well as planning and engagement strategies accordingly. You go to the next slide, please. So the first stage is to do some qualitative research. And you'll see here we're proposing to do focus groups. We have three focus groups proposed. Those would be conducted in Marin. Um, two of those would be with current customers, so both ones that have been enrolled for some time as well as some of the newly enrolled customers. And then one focus group that would be with customers who have chosen to opt out. We would also be conducting in-depth interviews with commercial customers, again, in Marin. Um, three with small business customers, and then three with medium or large customers. And the reason that we're proposing to do all of the qualitative research in Marin is because this is where you have a track record for two plus years. These are the people that know you the best, and we think we'll get the most meaningful insights that we can then use to develop the survey that we'll take into the field in Richmond and Marin. And if you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about that survey. So again, then using what we learn from those discussions, from that dialogue that we have, both in the focus groups as well as one-on-one -on -one with the commercial customers, we'll develop the survey to go and test what we've learned to see if we've been, if it's validated or see if maybe there's some things that we learned that are a little different, particularly in Marin, I'm sorry, in Richmond. Um, the number of customers that we're proposing to talk with is a total of 380 interviews. Um, these are conducted by live interviewers. These are not robocalls. Um, these are detailed conversations, uh, in-depth conversations that we would have with these customers, looking at doing a total of 200 with residential customers in Marin, and then 50 in Richmond, and then a total of 130 commercial customers, and that's 100 in Marin and 30 in Richmond. Next slide, please. And then based on that, we're gonna produce an actionable report that will lay out what we've found by doing the data analysis and modeling from these surveys and from these interviews so that we can have a discussion with you and talk about where there are opportunities to enhance or refine not only communications, but again, where you're getting involved in the community, both here looking ahead to where to get involved at the community level in Richmond to make sure that we're getting involved in places that make sense, that are important to our customers and that ultimately provide more value to them. And then lastly, it's about engagement. Again, it's about increasing visibility. It's making sure we're at the places that our customers want us. It's about improving an understanding of what a long-term relationship, what the value of that relationship is to customers, and ultimately providing them with better service that aligns with their expectations. Next slide. This one's very difficult to see, so I apologize, but they just want to kick off a couple of the key milestones. This is a timeline that we've developed for the research. Uh, this is based on a kickoff date that would be of August 6th. Um, as you can see here, the month of August would be devoted primarily to the qualitative research. So the first few weeks would be to develop the discussion guide that would be used for the focus groups as well as what we would use for the IDIs to be selected different tools. Um, it would also be to recruit people to participate in the focus groups. And then we're proposing on holding the focus groups at the end of August um, at a facility in Novato. Can, can I ask a question yes, here? Because I um, tried to read this too. It's not easy, right? Do the colors mean it? Do the colors of the Tetris looking blocks mean anything? It makes it easier to read if they are all the same color and difficult to read. I mean, are they supposed to be the same color? No, the answer is no. They're not supposed to be the same color, but no, they don't mean anything. Really it's just make it easier to read than if they were all the same, okay. the same color. So the fact that some are dark, some are light, some are brown, some are blue is is not doesn't lead us to understand anything. No, I okay. can maybe even correspond to where we had like the, the header of the category, but no, they don't they don't mean anything okay. the colors. So sorry for any confusion on that. Now the uh, the fact that a block is on a reef doesn't Indicate how much time is spent doing that during the week. It's simply correct, that something right. was done during the week. Correct. 
because for the focus groups, which would be a one day, we would do three in one day, one at four, one at six, one at eight p.m. That shows a week block. That would so be this is just day. kind of telling us. What's in happening. general, what's going to happen when, just to give you an idea of the timing. Um, so we, and we would actually we would have a report based on what what we learned from the in depth interviews as well as the focus groups by September fourteenth. Um, and from that report, there can be some learnings we can already start, you know, using to inform, inform strategy, recognizing that, you know, we do need to go into the field with the qualitative, which would happen near the end of September, mid to late September, and then October would be using to take the data to do the models, to do the analysis, so that we have a final report with recommendations about specific actions to take um, in early, um, very early no in November. So again, about a three month time frame from the start to the finish. Yeah. On the focus groups, they seem to be getting the names from the staff or from our from our data and how to and how to find the three different groups you were talking about. Yeah, how, how, you know, that one in terms of how we work with the vendors. How do you get the names? With the focus groups, um, we will add we will add a, a list. Uh, that, that I believe we're going to be getting from uh, from the staff, right. and we'll go through it and, and try to do some stratification in the sampling to make sure that we're screening out people that we don't want to be in, in, in the group. So but if you right. get the names only from staff, aren't you only likely to get people who like us? We're not giving yeah. names. No. We're giving a customer list. And oh, it's customer list. Yeah. Right. A and they're going to randomly pick from the customer list? Right. Correct. Right. 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 Okay. One question on the time frame, though. I think the whole point with the with the tremendous rollout in Marin and, and new customers and uh, temper customers in Richmond, customers in Marin are now making the decision whether or not to stay in the program. Um, so this sounds like we would have a completed survey by early November. Does that time frame work with what we're trying to accomplish here in terms of uh, the Roll out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, there will be there will be information that will get along the way that could inform some of our communications with customers as we go. That it will it will be um, completed before we launch into Richmond, which will well, I'm not just talking happen. about Richmond though. We're trying to figure out how to provide um, Marin customers who mm -hmm. are making the decision as we speak and will be over the next two months. Mm -hmm with the information they need to make an informed decision on whether or not down. So does this work with that? Yeah, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that we are going to be here for many years. We're going to have ongoing relationships with customers. There may be customers that chose to opt out at some point for whatever reason that we can attract back to the program. Um, and we'd like to make some concerted efforts to do that with this year. Um, we've actually, as, I, as I've mentioned to some of you, that we've seen a, a slightly higher opt-out rate um, with this uh, customer phase in, and, and part of that is tied to the um, the type of communication that we did with customers, that was a lot more visible and overt. And I think that was our goal: was to be um, extremely transparent and encourage folks to take action. Um, but that has um, resulted in a slightly higher than anticipated opt-out rate at this point in the in the time frame. Um, we would expect to be at this point, maybe six months from now. So, um, part of these efforts will help us to. Um, look at ways we can mitigate the impacts uh, that we're having now related to opt-outs and um, enable us to um, retain the customers that we have and potentially reach out to customers that might have been unsure in the opt-out phase um, and invite them to come back in. And also add that I think the trending with uh, our customers taking action on whether or not they wanted to opt out was earlier on. I think Dawn implied that, um, but it, it was, um, you know, what we're seeing now is, a, is the, the rate of customers opting out is significantly lower than it was in April and May. And we are still communicating with our customers. We sent out another opt-out notice recently, and the response to that, load, that notice was very small compared to what we've seen before. I think that, you know, what it tells us is that um, a significant amount of customers or potential customers have uh, made the choice about whether or not to enroll with Marine Clean Energy already. I think the number of customers who are making that decision um, is, a, is a lot lower now. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I have a couple questions about the interviews. Uh, you said there are going to be phone interviews, and I know from my experience when we get calls that are polling type calls, I always find it very frustrating because it's always an, an either-or answer. 
There's never any open-ended questions that are asked. There's never really the opportunity to give a meaningful answer. And so I always question whether the, the results or the data that are compiled are really useful or not. So that's one question that I have. The other question that I have is, when you call and do the interviews, are they informational at all? So you know, will you be giving any of these um, customers information you know, that might assist them that they don't already have? Sure, yeah. Um, I, we haven't designed an instrument yet, but generally speaking, um, we, we ask both closed-ended and open-ended questions. Uh, for any polling we do, and, and we're talking polls that usually go from 18 to 23 minutes for the interview. Uh, we, for that length of interview, we try and include at least three open-ended questions. Um, but I don't think that we're going to use that time as an opportunity to provide information to the people that we talk to. We're trying to basically ask meaningful questions that we hope will give us the results we want to help us figure out, you know, what kind of outcomes you want to achieve. And I think because of the statistical model that we've developed, which is why I think uh, Don and his staff wanted us to come to you tonight, is because that model is, is very unique and actionable, as, as Jessica quickly alluded to, but we could elaborate about that. That is what differentiates the kind of research that we're talking about tonight and what most other firms provide, especially, I'll say, in California. Okay, thank you. Who's the type of person that's actually conducting these interviews within your company? I can't imagine Jessica's calling <laughs> people. So uh, obviously you can have a staff, a group of people that are doing yeah. this. So. Our staff actually will do the in-depth interviews, right. but you're right, we will not actually conduct the 380. We have vendors that we do use for that piece. So that is not actually done by APCO staff. And but we, it's, during the interview process, we talked to Don and her, and her team about this, and the people who do these interviews are trained by us. We spend a lot of time with them to make sure that when they do these interviews, uh, you know, there are no missteps and uh, the interview goes as, you know, as, smoothly, as smoothly as it possibly can go. I guess the reason I ask the question with due respect to people from India, I you happen to get a call from India this morning, you know, <laughs> you know trying to sell me a product that I had no idea they were trying to sell me, but it didn't make sense. So I'm just wanting to make sure, you know, for the large amount of money that we're going to spend with your company that we're going to get very quality people that are going to be able to articulate the questions, respond to it, take down the data, and so we have good information to present to us. I can assure you that'll be the case. And we've got to source other than perhaps the Midwest. Right. Yeah. And we will also have, it will be APCO Insight staff conducting the focus groups as well, I should point out. So for all of the qualitative, that will be done by APCO staff. And they'll be the ones where we'll be doing all the, you know, the data analysis and the modeling, all of that as well. So the only piece where we use an outside vendor is for the survey. Since I'm having all the questions, I'll ask one more. The questionnaire, I see, I was reading the little blocks in here. So the types of questions, how they're, how they're phrased, all of that, I, I assume that you, you're going to rigorously review that with staff, and I'm not sure what level with the board or different committees with the board will get a chance to weigh in too, but I think it's really, really important because the questions aren't good, it doesn't matter. What, what what you come up with, because that's, I think, the most key point, I think. And the succession back again, and again, and so you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm in charge of what, what she does with the information we give to her. Yeah, I think this will be embedded at the executive committee, and um, that's where we typically talk about this sort of thing, um, but we'll certainly be bringing information to the board as um, as we have good chunks of information to help you. Yeah, my only thought is, I, there's only a, a for a focus on the executive committee. And I, I just think that this is really important. So to the extent the other board members are, are, are interested, I, I think more minds think better than less to come up with the very best questions we can. And I think that, that I'm just throwing that out as a suggestion. Let's go to Director Small. I have just a quick question. Um, will it be possible to have this broken out and given us information by community? Because some towns may have different, there may be different information from different communities and it will certainly help us as council people to be able to go back to our community if there's particular issues that arise. So however you talk to the customer base, I would like to know what may be of, of most concern to 
the constituents from my community. And then the other thing is, is I would find some way of rolling this out to the community that this survey will be done because Personally speaking, I get many phone calls, and as soon as I hear that it's a um, survey, I say no thank you and hang up. So um, I think that uh, you know we're very busy in our lives, and also I don't know when you make the calls, but I seem to get most of them uh, during dinner hour, which is so frustrating. Uh, so, uh, I, but I think you should roll out to the community and maybe through the IJ or some articles that this is going to actually be done and, and we would love to have the information and we would appreciate your participation if you feel so desired. I don't want, because I think a lot of people will just hang up. Mm -hmm. Great. Great suggestion. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Those are great suggestions. And, and just to um, tag on to Director Kahn's comment, um, just so everyone's aware, a reminder that all board members are welcome to participate at every committee meeting. That's why we send the agenda and the packet for the committee um, to all board members. Um, so absolutely everyone's welcome to attend. And if you can attend, but you have feedback on what you see in the packet, you can contact them. Director Bragg. Um, I was just wondering, um, I saw there's a dropout, pretty high dr anticipated dropout rate in San Francisco, or an anticipated dropout rate in San Francisco. Um, and I'm just wondering if you're going to be analyzing uh, PG&E's messaging because it seems to me that we're not, we not only need to find out what our customer base really wants, but I think some of the decisions may be driven by some of the messaging that PG&E is putting out there. So I'm just wondering whether that's going to be part within the scope of what uh, you guys are going to be doing. One of the challenges that we'll have early on in this process is, is deciding how we want to have a conversation with individuals when we do in-depth interviews and the participants in a focus group. I suspect that we're going to all want to try and generate conversations with, with folks that indirectly sort of get people to talk about the kinds of messages that, that PG&E has been putting out there, we're somewhat familiar with that, needless to say. But I don't think we would be so direct in, in, in our, particularly when we get to the quantitative part of the process, to basically try and characterize something as a pg and &E message. So I think the answer to your question, Larry, is yes, we will do that, and we'll find a way to do that indirectly, so that we're going to be satisfied that we understand how people feel about the range of issues, the range of arguments, that have been raised over the last couple of years. Right, so it's going to be built into your approach. Right. Okay. Thanks. Director Wachtel. Uh, a couple of things. I, I would hesitate participating too much in their drawing up the questions. You're, we're hiring these people for a lot of money, and, and they're professionals, and I don't want to putster too much with that. But the, the, and, and I don't disagree with you. Of course, it's always, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but go ahead. Well, you know, we can, we can talk about this later, but my, my point of view is that if we don't think they know what they're doing, let's, let's not hire them. But if we think we know what they're doing, then I don't know that our input is going to make their questions any more relevant than what the professionals think. I guess my response, the only reason why I'm suggesting input, you're right, they're, they're experts at surveying and have a lot of experience apparently in the energy industry, so that's why Don picked them. All I'm saying is, is for it to sensitize them that we have a carpet of fiefdoms here. <laughs> we got, we got, we have the county and we got 11, uh, 11 little cities, or some a little bit bigger than the others. And the the politics, the opinions, the way people think is very different across the county. And and so the same set of questions will be by depending upon who the person is answering. And a lot, in some measure, does depend upon where that person lives and, and all of that. And so that's all I'm trying to sensitize you to. So I know for our own small city, when we've done surveys, those surveys were very, were, were that company was asking very carefully what, in my, in our, in my situation, was with the city council, specifically to our town, because our, because our staff and our city council knows, presumably, 
knows their town well, and so now you've got a county of 260,000, but it's not like Sacramento, I guess, where Jessica's from, where it's a, a larger city. We really are fragmented, and I just wanted to sensitize that. So when Carla asked the question, can you ask for her town, you know, and I, I saw a, a kind of shrug or shake your shoulders, like that's gonna be difficult. I don't know how you can, whether you can do it by town, by zip code. No, we can break it down by I don't think they're gonna make trouble identifying by zip code the source of the information that they're gonna get. And I don't think we're quite as homogeneous as San Francisco is with regard to their views on energy. But really the question, really the question I wanted to get to is I see that the, the, the analysis that we're asking these people to do really do approach two different sets of people. One are the Marin people, and the other is the people in Richmond. The Marin people will have either opted out already or, or not, and so there's a purpose to see whether we can get them in or whether we can have retention. That, that's, that's one part. But I think a really, really, really important part of what I would like, and it doesn't indicate on your charts how much time you're dedicating to Richmond as opposed to dedicating the second point. It may be there. I can't see that small. Yeah. Um, how much time you're dedicating to Richmond and how much time you're dedicating to Marin. But I really think a significant part of this should be dedicated to our entry into Richmond and how we can make that as smooth and fluid as possible. I think there's going to be some issues. And I, and I, really, I really look to you guys to help us significantly there. And, and I really think more than the Marin retention. Well, why don't we ask Don why we're doing this? Maybe we just, I mean, I, I think the staff. Well, it would be fun actually, happens. Director yeah. Sears has, is, wants to kind of elaborate. I, I really do, because, okay. because I share the same concerns that you do, Ken. And in our, in our staff report, it did set up the numbers of how many people in Marin, both residential and commercial, uh, would be involved in this study and how many enrichment. And I can certainly understand the desire to talk to a lot of people in Marin because we are the people here who've had experience with MEA. But I'm, I'm quite concerned about the imbalance. So there's 200, the proposal is 200 Marin County residential customers, 50 Marin small commercial customers, 50 Marin medium to large business customers, 50 Richmond residential customers and 30 Richmond okay, business customers. And so uh, I have a number of issues here on this, on stage one where you're really doing the qualitative analysis as you indicated that's Marin only. And that of course makes sense to some extent because those are the people as I said who've had the experience. But you're then going to stage two, the quantitative analysis portion of it and you're basing two out of the three factors of information you're trying to develop in the quantitative analysis on perceptions and information that you've gotten in stage one, which is only from Marin residents. And you know, you've already heard people bring up the issue of the diversity that we have here in Marin. We really are not familiar with the Richmond market. And so it, it very much concerns me that we'll then go ask a very much smaller number of people in Richmond if they agree with what the people in Marin have said were their priorities. And I'm just concerned that that may not fully uh, explore or give us basis to assess what the priorities and values of people in Richmond are. So that's one piece of it. Um, second piece is, and Don, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my impression based on prior conversations that we think there's a, a significant opportunity for commercial customers in Richmond. Um, no, I, I think that um, the what we've talked about is some of the, the large commercial customers uh -huh. in Richmond may be difficult customers to serve for a number of reasons. And so um, those customers are not necessarily um, important to the agency. In fact, those customers may be enrolled in a later phase, um, but there's not a need to, to really focus on um, those uh, large industrial customers. Right. Um, so we don't actually think that the user, the customer mix, in Richmond, I mean, it, given how I personally think little we know about Richmond, this is kind of guesstimating, but uh, we don't expect there to be a different customer mix between residential and commercial in Richmond than we've already seen to date in Marin? No, there, 
there certainly will be a, a different customer mix. Um, yeah, but I, I guess I just wanted to clarify that the, the large commercial customers aren't um, necessarily need to be a focus. Understood, but that but there are other commercial customers who are not large, and to the extent that there may be uh, an enhanced opportunity to get that body of commercial customers in Richmond, it seems to me that we don't capture that. We don't get enough information by only talking to 30 of them. So, I mean, I, I share Director Wachtell's concerns here that we're, we've kind of got an apples and oranges issue because needs that we may have in Marin are quite different. I mean, if the issue is going forward, will we be able to change the hearts and minds of some of our opt-outs and just inform our people so that we can continue to have beneficial customer relations, that's very different than finding out enough about a very new market in which we have no experience so we are best informed on how to market our product and inform those customers and really figure out what their issues are. So I think I've laid out my concerns about do we, is there a proper, really a proper mix here of uh, the targeted participants in the survey? So Don, how would you, what, how do you want to deal with it? With this excellent line of questioning here. I mean, I have some thoughts and we've had, we've changed some things as you know. Uh, over the last couple of weeks. So do you want to respond first? Yeah, okay. yeah I'd like to. Um, I, I, what I'd like to um, ask, and this it's interesting that um, I know that it's um, what you're bringing up is something that we brought up also. We had the same question, mm -hmm. why, the, why the breakdown? Mm -hmm. um, is this the best approach? And so um, with you all being the experts that have you know, been doing this, this is, your, uh, this is what you do, um, we'd like to look to you to see if there's a way you might recommend a uh, modification that might um, uh, allow us to um, glean more information from Richmond without impacting the overall um, out overall incomes of the uh, outcomes of the program. We can do that. Um, and we can certainly try to do that within the constraints of I reckon budget. just a budget constraints, yeah. <laughs> but if there was a bigger budget. About that, <laughs> <but I'm laughs> so, um, let me, let me say one thing, though, to kind of just fill in maybe a blank for everybody here. Uh, and, and this is a hard thing to, to really understand without actually seeing our, our model. <laughs> really what we're doing when we, when we go through the qualitative phase is we're trying to identify what we call attributes. And when we've done this in the past and we've done it for, you know, a couple of other energy companies, what we find is that we're, there are a lot of attributes, many of which can be grouped or lumped together. You know, 100 to 120, you know, different attributes. Again, many of which can be grouped. So the question that you're raising is, can we assume that the attributes that we can isolate during the qualitative research phase in Marin County be exactly those attributes that would be identified if we were to do qualitative research in the city of Richmond? And that is a fair question. So. You know, we did make an assumption that we could use the attributes to identify in Marin County and use them basically as a way to, to create a model to find out what people in Richmond think. And that may or may not be true without doing qualitative research in the city of Richmond. The other thing that's worth mentioning is um, that we, if we make adjustments here, um, we could one of the adjustments we may want to consider is a, a shifting of the number of folks um, you know, in one of these groups to another. Um, we, it's worth mentioning that at the beginning of our discussions with APCO Worldwide, the initial proposal was coming in a bit higher um, as far as the overall cost, and it was um, included a greater sample size. Um, we um, worked to reduce the cost, and um, as a result, it, it um, impacted the, the sample size. So. Um, we, I don't think we have ability to add to these numbers, these total numbers, but there may be an ability to uh, make some subtle shifts between the groupings. Uh, the only other thing I would add is when we were looking at the numbers, both the original proposal and working with Don and staff on adjusting some of those numbers, we also were looking at you know, the customer base and what was you know, somewhat proportionate. You know, understanding that yes, it's very important to understand you know Richmond as we prepare as you prepare to enroll customers there, but also not wanting to neglect the 95,000 customers in Marin and making sure you know, that we understand their expectations and values as well, um, because you know, that's, well, that's sure, a very important. Well, sure, but they're situated well. differently than the Richmond customers right, that we don't have yet. I mean, this is and it and it goes back to 
Damon's question about timing issues. I mean, if, if we complete an, our opt-out period by November, and we don't have a final analysis, and this is, I'm not faulting anyone, if we don't have a final analysis of the survey until November, then it's not, I think it's going to be hard to say that the survey data is going to have a significant impact on our immediate opt-out period, right? right? It's more of a, it's more of a forward-looking uh, study, which can be helpful, but, but that's a very different goal and need than is to understand a brand new market where we're about, where we're about to launch. So um, I, I just think we need to give some more thought to, I, and I understand the proportionality issue, but because these customer bases are so differently situated right now, I'm not sure that strict proportionality is the best guide to, to where, how we end up with our numbers and what categories. I, I agree with Director Sears, but one thing I want to add too is there's a factor with regard to Richmond that I would like to know about that I don't really need to know about Marin. And that is, is there is there going to be any resistance to people in Richmond joining an organization called Marin Clean Energy? Now, you're not going to have that resistance in presumably Marin cities. And I don't know if it's real, but I, I'd like you guys to tell us. Um, and, and, and if there is a reason, I mean, but see, those are questions that you're not going to, obviously not going to ask the Marin residents. But, and, and you know, I, I think we really need to know, is there any sensitivity to a non-Marin city, no matter where it is, a non-Marin city, buying their energy, you're joining a JPA, you're joining an organization that's called Marin Clean Energy, and if there is that sensitivity, what can we do through our marketing and what can we do through our reach outreach in order to resolve that sensitivity? That's something that I think is really, my perception is that's really important. Because uh, I don't think people outside Marin see Marin the same way as people inside Marin. <laughs> and and, and I, I'm thrilled that Richmond wants, as a community, to join MEA, and I welcome them open-handedly, open-armedly, whatever. Um, but we got individual voters there who were gonna opt in or opt out with, with their feet, and I have, we have to understand those people. And that's really what I look to you guys for. Well, okay. we agree. Director Green. One of the things that, that concerns me is if, I, I think I heard you correctly, and what I heard was that you're not going to do any sort of qualitative assessment as to Richmond. And when you compare the Richmond community and the Marin community, the demographics differ in two dramatic regards. Uh, one has to do with race, and the other has to do with money. People in Marin are white and wealthy, generally speaking. People in Richmond are African American and not nearly so wealthy. And I think one of the perceptual challenges that we would have, just from a common sense point of view, with respect to a, a marketing approach, is we don't want to be a bunch of Marinites going with an uneducated, insensitive marketing campaign that hasn't done any sort of research or asked any kind of qualitative questions as to the people in Richmond, and to use the vernacular, lay our trip on them. Uh, we would really want to have some pr pretty profound sensitivities so that we don't s step all over ourselves uh, in broaching uh, what has every potential of being a very promising partnership uh, just because, and, and, and especially spend a lot of money on, on marketing where it's something, uh, what the result is for us, if we want to save our opt-outs and we get the information, it's too late to save our opt-outs, what's the point of doing that? And, but, and if what we want to do is uh, be appropriate in terms of our overtures so as to not 
generate undue opt-outs in Richmond, we better pay clear attention to our demographics there. You don't want the notices to have peacock feathers on them. <laughs> you no, know, we don't want notices with peacock feathers. That's right. I mean, can you guys comment on that? I mean, is that, that seems to make sense, but professionally speaking, what are your thoughts on it? We, are, we welcome the opportunity to come, come back and have another discussion with our researchers in DC and on our staff and to see if we can, how we can take the budget that you've got before you tonight and see how we can change some things around so that we are doing qualitative research in Richmond and reallocated resources so that we have a balance that I think strikes the kind of core that you, that I'm hearing many of you articulate. Director Collins, I, mean, I, I was going to come by. I would assume that, you know, looking at your resume, that that's what you, that is what you do, and that that's how you do it, and that you'll analyze uh, how you're going to approach this based upon the demographics. Otherwise, um, we could do it ourselves. So, you and me, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I also assume that, that it's not it's not going to be a shotgun. It's going to be phased. You're going to go first where you have the least amount of time, and where you need the answer the soonest. You're going to address that and then go to the next step. I think that's why I wanted to put a time in. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I, I guess the other thing related to that, um, just as there's been a suggestion here that some directors may want more input, whether whether or not we should actually have any input on crafting questions, I think is an open question. But mm -hmm. to the extent that there's an opportunity for directors to have to provide knowledge that they have about their specific communities. I think we'd want to in include our Richmond folks also to help inform that piece of the research, which is something you probably talked about already. Yeah. Yeah. This is really helpful feedback, and um, it's very um, uniform feedback. So I think um, we will be able to um, uh, incorporate the suggestions that have been made here tonight um, and um, integrate them into the project. Thank you. Super. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And great comments. Thank you guys. Um, we voting on this? So where are we at at this point? It sounds like we're going to have a, first of all, we will get to public comment. I, I had a few more comments, but certainly if there are more questions. Why we do that, but then I think what we're hearing too is we're going to have a revised proposal come back to us. Um, the, I wasn't actually suggesting that, but I, I think that the, the direction is, is pretty clear and that we can incorporate it um, into this contract. I think it's a matter of um, making some reductions in some of the numbers and increasing um, the Richmond numbers. Uh, but I, um, my recommendation would be that we um, go forward with the contract approval tonight so that we're able to get the work started um, rather than wait until September. What, wasn't that the purpose yeah. of this meeting? That yeah. was the reason we're here. This is a special yeah. meeting exactly. for the purpose of approving yeah. this. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Let's hear from members of the public at this point. First, very excited, very, very excited and thrilled that we will have the level of expertise and experience that you bring. Um, it's going to make all the difference in terms of how we um, embrace our customer base and develop that relationship here in, in, in Richmond. Um, I just have a question about, um, there was a comment made about not specifically asking questions about pg &E. I totally get that. But I happened to be watching television the other night, which I very rarely do, and there was the new CEO of pg &E that made the most compelling statement on a commercial. And he said, we're a company who lost our way, and we want to be your energy company, and we want to be the blue guys, or the guys in the blue trucks. And, um, I believe that the pg and marketing and public relations campaign is going to be a moving target. And um, I'm hoping that you will be able to inform the, um, the search with intelligence about what they're doing and where. And also, if we would be able to gauge at all um, the developing consumer response to their messaging. 
which I think is going to be um, important because they aren't going to stop. So I just thought I'd throw those things out there for consideration. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Stan Sparrow from Tiburon. My view is actually of Richmond, looking out from Tiburon. <laughs> and all the time I've seen this big cloud of smoke coming from Chevron. And from my experience of going to the Richmond town meeting there, their big concern is in air quality. You wouldn't believe the pollution there. And we all share the same air. It's one air, one water, one planet. That's why we're here and doing this for the greenhouse effect. And, um, I'm really passionate about that, and that's why it comes to all these things. And the other big thing in Richmond, wow, 50% unemployment. Oh, I was really surprised. And also going to Richmond and talking to some of the people who were working there, wow, the, the safety and the crime is seven times higher than Tiburon. Seven times higher. Wow, and we're just right across the water. That's our neighbors. It's just astounding. Um, I actually grew up in a family which talked about marketing research a lot. My dad worked for the Nielsen Company. And uh, so. Um, and I'm very familiar with how, how it works. Uh, I just want to um, say that I, I really agree with the comments about needing marketing research um, more, more for um, Richmond um, messages. Um, I don't know if people from Washington, D.C. could really gauge the you know, enormous differences between Richmond and, and Marin. Plus the fact that a lot of people in Richmond work in Marin, um, and it's a very complex situation that, that we have here. Um, but um, I also want to say that I, I don't think that we're at a point where it's just corporate advertising or marketing that, that we're needing. I mean, we this is a political situation. I mean, the PG&E MEA is, a, is still a political fight. One of these days will be, a, you know, more like corporation, but not, we're not there yet. We're still in, in a very difficult situation. And I really want to warn you about, you know, considering marketing a, you know, a neutral um, thing. I, it's not it's not a neutral thing, and, and the timing makes a huge difference. And how you ask the questions and what the questions are may make a really huge difference. And I think right now we're at a point where people, you know, most people are still not that familiar with MEA, they're, and they're just getting rolled in. There's enormous uncertainty about the rates anyway, because they're all changing. And, you know, the, I, my understanding is that our rates are going to be a little bit less than pg &E. you, you know, the, the difference is a little bit less than it would have been a little a while ago. But people are going to be in confusion because their bills are going to be changing in any case. And that, I really feel like we need to let that sit for a few months and get, let those kinks get worked out because otherwise we're just going to be getting the responses to that uncertainty. Um, and, and I also really have to say, um, you know, I, I, can, I can understand why people in San Francisco might not be crazy about clean power San Francisco, but a poll that it, or whatever your marketing research did that said that people, pe people like pg and &E, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that in a lot of ways. I think you need a, to go deeper than that. And I'm not just, just because I'm an advocate. I, um, I think that the Prop 16 vote showed that people in Northern California didn't, you know, weren't very crazy about pg and &E. uh, There's also the San Bruno issues. I and mean, there's a lot of issues right now with pg and &E that, um, you know, that, that people have. I mean, they might have issues with MEA, but mostly I think that they, we still have quite low visibility. Um, but don't, you know, don't underestimate the damage that we can cause ourselves by having a, a poll that says, oh, well, people aren't that crazy about MEA. They really like PG&E. You know, it's like, you know, we're going to pay a lot of money for a poll like that. I really think that would be a terrible mistake at a time like this because we're, you know, we're very vulnerable right now. PG&E has still got enormous marketing budget. 
their energy efficiency, I mean, they're going to roll out a whole new um, energy efficiency marketing program. Um, we haven't even seen that yet. And, we, you know, they haven't quite regrouped um, since Darby left and this new guy came in. But uh, I think that we're going to see a lot of, of moves by PG&E. I mean, one of them in the proceeding right now, the, they are amping up their local government partnerships on energy efficiency. They, they want to just be everybody's friend. Um, so, so those kinds of things uh, will be some of what we're up against here in Marin. I mean, in, in Richmond, you know, it's, it's a really different story, I think, and that I think would be worth um, getting some information on. But I really hope that we get this in terms more of focus groups that we can use internally and not, you know, I, I mean, I know it's a public agency and you can't keep things from, you know, from going public, but um, I, I really think it would be a mistake to, you know, to pay a lot of money and, you know, and have people say, oh, well, yeah, you know, I don't know about NBA, and, they, you know, my rates double. I mean, I've heard that from, you know, people that, that really, you know, are you know trying to like MEA, but they think the rates doubled. I mean, we haven't resolved those problems yet. I mean, the, these billing errors are continuing. They're continuing for a reason. PG&E wants people to be confused. They want people not to like us. So, you know, it, it, the results of this poll or focus groups may just tell us that PG&E's you know dirty tricks are being successful. Well, you know, duh. Right. Um, and I, you know. I think that you know we need to put a lot more money into positive advertising, and you know it does help to have some you know some research on that. But um, I you know I'm I'm concerned. I, I didn't make the executive committee meeting when I hear that you know you're moving forward on August 6th. I mean it's like you know this is a done deal apparently. So, uh, but I I just think that having a, you know having calls go out this month. I mean this, this is a you know, this is when people really don't, you know, they don't know which end is up about NEA. They're just brand new. It doesn't seem quite like the right time. All right, well, thank, thank you, Barbara, uh, for that input. I mean, you know, I think the real objective here is to do the deep dive and get the kind of information you're talking about in a professional way. So, can I just respond to one thing? Yeah. You know, Barbara, one of the reasons why the executive committee felt that it was important to go forward is because we are concerned about the rollout in Richmond, and the, rich, and the rollout's gonna occur in the spring, and in order to get the information so that we can be infected, we have to start doing this now. And so that's, that's just the timeline that we're on, and so staff and the executive uh, uh, committee thought it was important to uh, get this going so that we can get a, 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 you know, a consultant like, like we found here to be able to get us the information so we can be infected. It's really important that the rollout with Richmond is really effective. It's well, I think it's important that the rollout here be effective first. And I, I, don't, I think that we're moving on too quickly. I mean, I'm not opposed to you know the rollout happening in, in Richmond, but I don't see a lot of proactive MEA um, marketing happening here. And, and I, I don't know. I haven't seen what the amount is on this contract, but that's really... Um, you know, something that I, I, I would like to see a whole lot more going on in Marin, and then, you know, and Richmond is another story. Yes. Well, they, okay, and again, as we start out the conversation with, this effort is directed toward Marin as well. Mm -hmm. um, my view is we're at a critical time right now with, with the uh, increase in customers in Marin. So, mm -hmm. Director Collins? Yeah, I've just spent the last year with a marketing and communication task force in Tiburon, we, we decided that we, we needed to do something about our downtown and make it better. And we, we marketed, we, we, we solicited and we got six experts that live in our community. These are men that have run and women that have, that have been CEOs of companies, presidents, owners. They're the marketing and communication experts. It, 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 they really are home run hitters. So I've been with them for a year and, and learned a great deal about since I knew nothing about it, and still know very little. And the first thing that they did is their research, their homework. Dig deep, deep, deep to get the information. And then, once you have that, then address the marketing strategy and how do you communicate it. So it, it is a process. 
And it seems to me that the, the start of the process is is knowing you know knowing who the other players, how many left handers do they have, how many right handers do they have, and, and what's the, what does their bench look like? And so um, I'm really in favor of, of, of digging down and getting the information. Uh, another item that, that, in my own experience, I found that Marin Clean Energy's um, acceptance in my community also cut across political lines, mm -hmm. extremely so. Uh, and, and, and we haven't talked about that tonight, so there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot to this, this onion that, to be peeled, I think. And we're in the big leagues now, this is a sound business tool, and uh, I'm very much in favor of it. Okay, any further uh, comments or questions? I may make a motion. Got a motion for approval of the contract. Go a second. Pursuant to, uh, based on conversations and some retooling of uh, priority. Yeah, I'll, I'll accept that, Director. Uh, I guess we leave that to discretion. Uh, oh. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm oh, comfortable that. doing that. But I just want to make sure clear on the motion. I think Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it is not as stated in the packet. Right. No. So the motion is for approval with with the with the um, board directors' mm -hmm. comments mm -hmm. taken into consideration. Yes. So the motion will reflect that, and we have a second from Director Wachtel. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed. That's right there. Oh, right there. <laughs> Okay, item seven, power purchase agreement with RE Kansas LLC. Okay. A so California based company. <laughs> so this uh, this power purchase agreement, this project I briefed you on at last month's meeting, if you recall. Um, we had it on the agenda for approval then, and there were some few last minute uh, tweaks that we had to make during negotiations. Um, so we presented that as information only, um, and but for now we have the PPA finalized, and so tonight we're, we're asking and recommending that you approve the, uh, the contract. So since I already went through much of this information, I thought I would just tonight uh, briefly recap that um, and then talk a little bit about what has changed from the PPA um, that you saw last month. Um, and then uh, to the extent that you have any questions, of course, I'm happy to answer them. So just a little uh, background on this particular project. Uh, this is a proposed uh, it's in development solar photovoltaic um, facility located in Central Valley, California. It is a, a project that it will be under contract to one of the investor-owned utilities um, starting in 2018. The, uh, the IOU in this case indicated to the developer, which is Recurrent, um, Recurrent Energy, that they didn't have a need for the power until 2018. Uh, Recurrent approached MEA uh, recognizing that they could develop the project much sooner than that, so they, they approached MEA to see if uh, MEA would be interested in a, a short-term power purchase agreement uh, that would kick in from the, the time that the project's online to the 2018 date when uh, the uh, contract with the investor-run utility um, would become effective. So uh, we, we looked at that and, and uh, realized that that would fit well with uh, MEA's needs as um, as the, uh, the contract with, with Cena falls off, uh, there's going to be additional need for renewable power that, that uh, MEA has, and so it, it seemed to be a good fit. Uh, and so we decided to negotiate with Recurrent, and, um, and so the PPA for tonight is, is the, the fruit of those negotiations. The, um, a little bit about Recurrent, uh, they're headquartered in San Francisco, so it's a U.S.-based company. Uh, they are a... Uh, an affiliate, or actually a subsidiary of Sharp Corporation, uh, wholly owned subsidiary of Sharp Corporation, they're, and they're actually the global development arm uh, for Sharp's uh, PV business. So Sharp's a, a, a real uh, prominent uh, PV module manufacturer, recurrent, develops projects um, on, on behalf of Sharp. So the, uh, in regards to the, the counterparty, the, the developer itself, we're, staff is, is, is very comfortable uh, with Recurrent. Uh, they have a, a real good track record. Um, 
they've uh, developed, uh, they've got operational projects in California, either operating or in development of about 150 megawatts. Um, and they did the uh, Sunset Reservoir project over in San Francisco. So they're, they're a, um, a, a well regarded developer. The uh, project itself is, it's known as uh, RE Kansas. It's located, or it will be located in the city of Lemoore. Uh, which is down in Kings County. It will be a 20 megawatt uh, single access tracking PV array. Um, the, uh, the amount of power that it'll produce is roughly just shy of 50,000 megawatt hours annually. So that's enough power um, to provide the annual needs of about 8,000 of MEA's customers um, just from this, this one project. The, um, the, it, the contract itself would be will be uh, for two years or perhaps a little bit longer. Um, the, the way that the contract is structured is that there's a guaranteed commercial operation date of January uh, 1, 2016. So if the project is uh, comes online in accordance with that, then the PPA would run for two years, you know, 2016 and 2017, and then terminate. Uh, at the end of 2017, the uh, there's a an opportunity if the project is constructed constructed ahead of that within a certain time parameters, uh, that MEA would take the power as soon as um, January 2015. So it's potentially a three-year uh, deal, but nominally speaking, it's a two-year deal. The um, the change that uh, I wanted to, to talk about relative to uh, the PPA that we had last month is really it's related to this issue of full deliverability uh, status of the project and um, some, uh, some ways to mitigate the risks around that, and I'll, and I'll explain what I'm, what I'm talking about there. So in order for this project to, to provide capacity, uh, as a product, and which is something that MEA needs to meet capacity requirements, resource adequacy requirements. The, uh, the CAISO, the uh, California Independent System Operator, has to study the project and essentially verify or determine that it can, it, it, the power can be delivered. Um, and if uh, under, under different conditions on the system. And uh, it, it's, it's Possible. So the CAISO does these deliverability studies, and it, as a result of those studies, they, the CAISO could determine that certain transmission system upgrades are necessary, and there would be a price tag associated with that. So with this particular project, the study, the full deliverability study, will be scheduled to be completed in December of this year. So there's some uncertainty as to what those potential upgrade costs would be. Um, so the way that uh, Recurrent is, is, is mitigating that is um, they've, uh, they've negotiated with us the right to substitute um, for this project. If the upgrade costs come in greater than uh, expected, they could substitute one of six other projects that have been uh, pre-approved by MEA. If, we, uh, if you uh, um, confirm this, this agreement, and that are described in the agreement itself. So that's the provision that was sort of still in play last month and that we've, we've now come to agreement on. Um, in all likelihood, the, the project would be already Kansas, but, there's a, that, but Recurrent would have an opportunity to declare essentially uh, by June of 2014 that it's one of these six other projects. They're all very similar. They're all 20 megawatt, in one case 19 megawatt PV projects in the Central Valley um, and all in very similar stages of development. So that's the, um, that's the change. In, in regards to our recommendation, uh, we do recommend approving this contract. We see it as a very good fit for MEA's portfolio needs. It's a very good price. Um, this actually will be the lowest price uh, California-based renewable uh, contract that, that MEA has done. Uh, it's a very attractive price. And, um, we're very comfortable with the developer and, and with the rent. So for all those reasons, we recommend approval. Happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, John. Any questions, Director Bragman? If, if we get kicked to a secondary project, does that affect the time frame, or could no. we get a longer term? 
Oh, now none of the other provisions of the PPA would be impacted by an alternate site. Um, so there's still, it would be the same guaranteed commercial online date, that January 2016 date, uh, that, that this, the, the project would have to uh, be delivering to MEA, and it would be uh, the same term. This is a parallel <coughs> provision, this alternative site that is in the utility contract. Um, so uh, they're being negotiated essentially in parallel. The bulk, from what we're hearing from recurrent utility, um, is going to execute their agreement with the current tomorrow. John, is there a benefit to uh, MEAs having the right to elect which of the six would, would, uh, would want to step up? The, the benefit really is in giving us greater assurance that we'll get the capacity value from the project. Um, would, would we want to pick and choose which one? You know, we're, we're pretty pretty well indifferent to the various sites. They, from an operational point of view, these are pretty much the same, same type of project. Any other questions? Uh, members of the public on this item? Okay, bringing it back to the board. For the discussion, ready to make a motion for approval. I'll move to approve. Second. So, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, good work, John. Okay, I didn't